everyone at one time in their life fears being grabbed by the ghoulies, but before we enter the haunted halls of Ghoulhaven Mansion, I'd like to instead grab some Magic Spoon, which is sponsoring today's episode. Whenever I get pooped from beating up hordes of the undead or googly-eyed spiders, I reach for either a wholesome bowl of the cereal or the new line of treat bars, which come in a variety of flavors like marshmallow, chocolatey peanut butter, or the new kids on the block, double chocolate, and blueberry muffin, which is my personal favorite. Whichever one you choose and whatever time you choose, either a midday or midnight snack, you can't really go wrong, as both the cereal and the bars make for a simple, high-protein treat while not skimping on the nostalgic Saturday morning-style flavor you love. So, if you're interested in mixing and matching your own custom order of cereal flavors or comboing that with any of the new treat bars, use my code McMuscles at checkout. Scan the QR code on your screen or hit the link in the description and pin comment below to get $5 off your order today. And if you're not completely satisfied, you can get a 100% refund, no questions asked. Thanks again to Magic Spoon for the sponsorship. Without further ado, it's time to get grabbed by some ghoulies. Hello and welcome to another fright-having and ball-grabbing episode of What Happened, the investigative YouTube-style pop culture media show that rubs the radishes and pets the piglets to find the most interesting and or wacky development tales in the video game industry. And you can't use the word wacky without immediately thinking about googly eyes. And I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. You can't think about googly eyes without thinking about Rare, who are the masters of that particular form of ocular-based comedy. While we've covered many a game from their storied history, and I'm sure at least one or two more in the future, you can't honestly say that any of them were terrible, unplayable disasters. But today's subject often gets saddled with the reputation of representing a shift in the legendary studio's output, which, as we'll see, is not really warranted. So spike up your hair and grab the nearest weapon or household object that isn't nailed down as I answer the question, what happened to Grabbed by the Ghoulies? After finishing up the second adventure of their iconic bird and bear duo, the Banjo team over at Rare were looking to do something radically different for their next project, and hopefully less complicated than having to weave together massive interconnected biomes. As designer Greg Mayles recounted in Rare Revealed, the making of Grab by the Ghoulies, this project started not with a particular design in mind, but instead with a rather peculiar name. He recalled hearing someone at Rare casually bringing up a certain British schoolyard expression which described the act of, well... Now who sold you the stuff, huh? Get, get this, sir? Get the line. And then thinking, that would be a great name for a game, which it did after one clever tweak to the spelling, of course. Since the team were starting new, then they wanted this to be a straightforward experience that anyone could pick up and play and have a spooky good time with, and look to things like Scooby-Doo and various silent horror comedy films as inspiration. Alongside that, since Tui pushed the Nintendo 64 to its absolute limits, and with Nintendo finally shipping Dolphin dev kits to its partners, the Banjo team decided to start fresh with this much shinier Cubic hardware. Their original vision for Ghoulies was fairly similar to what they eventually shipped, a fun, cheeky take on horror tropes with tried-and-true beat-em-up action gameplay, having players use their fists and a variety of weapons to take out hordes of skeletons, spiders, zombies, and other baddies straight out of Boo! Haunted House! Now, despite Rare having then released a string of platformers, racers, and fighting games, comedic horror and brawling wouldn't be too out of their old wheelhouse considering in their NES days they'd also worked on the likes of Beetlejuice, Battletoads, and, and wait, they actually developed Boo Haunted House, like for real! The earliest versions of Ghoulies, according to an old archived Q&A on Rare's site, circa 2004, stated that the game was originally going to have more adventure elements, where the player would have more choices in which areas of Ghoulhaven Hall to explore next. 
I asked two former Rare staffers, Chris Sutherland and Steve Mails, about this, but neither could really recall that being an early part of the design. Regardless, our plucky hero Rick, I, I mean Cooper, still had to venture into Ghoulhaven Hall to rescue his girlfriend Amber from the clutches of Baron Von Ghoul of the Von Ghoul dynasty, with the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay largely composed of action-heavy brawling. Development kicked off with the GameCube starting in October of 2000, and was worked on for a very brief period of time before it appeared at E3 2001 in a Behind the Closed Doors presentation. The footage you see here shows off several things that would ultimately not make the final game, like Amber appearing as a playable character along with various enemies or ghoulies that were left on the cutting room floor. It should also be noted that around the time of this presentation, the name grabbed by the ghoulies had leaked out, but instead of it being attributed to a new game altogether, it somehow erroneously became the rumored subtitle of a new Conquer game, as it certainly had that um, familiar, nutty, conquerish flavor to it. As the team continued to flesh things out, they eventually started adjusting their initial design, something that was confirmed to me by artist Steve Males. Initially, the aim was to have the player fighting off loads of baddies at the same time, similar to Dead Rising that released three years later. But as time went on, baddie numbers were decreased in favor of enemies with much more specialized attacks. Still just as hectic, but but with a bit more strategy. The more free-roaming adventure elements, if they ever existed, were also then pared back as the team honed in on a more linear structure, tasking the player to clear out each room in a set path, almost like a spooky amusement ride. To spice this up though, they decided to add various gimmicks or modifiers to each room, such as time limits, lower health, having to hunt for a key, or killing a specific enemy type to keep things fresh. So while things were going relatively smoothly with the design, Ghoulies, like almost all rare games I've covered before, found itself at a bit of an impasse when, in September of 2002, Nintendo sold their stake in Rare over to Microsoft. While this didn't affect the game's development in any massive way, it did change the perception of Ghoulies a great deal, as it was originally intended for GameCube users and not the typical Dorito-loving Halo slash DOAites that typified the Xbox fanbase. Far worse, though, was the fact that due to sheer luck buoyed by various other rare projects getting either retooled or cancelled, Ghoulies was now suddenly thrust, rather unfairly, into the spotlight of being the first title under this new and very unexpected partnership. Xbox fans not really being into having their ghoulies grabbed is certainly something we're going to explore a little bit later on, but there were still a few other issues Rare had to figure out in terms of gameplay that I was fortunate enough to get some insight on. I also spoke to Chris Sutherland, a longtime ex-Rare and now Platonic employee, who had a hand in programming a number of their classics dating all the way back to Battletoads, and of course was the voice that many fighting game fans can still hear echoing through their memory palaces. Killer Instinct. He explained to me how even though Ghoulie's combat mechanics seemed rather simple on the surface, implementing them was anything but. I think getting the directional attacks to work as the player would expect was surprisingly challenging. It sounds like common sense to attack slash interact with the thing in the direction of where you push the thumbstick, but in fact that isn't always the best option, e.g. you might be pushing the attack stick towards enemy A, but there might be enemy B that is closer to attacking you but slightly to one side, so the player may actually have preferred to attack them. Unlike a mouse with a cursor, you don't have visual feedback to see how accurate you are with your directional stick pushes. Yeah, for those that have never had the pleasure of going hands-on with these particular ghoulies, melee combat was exclusively carried out by not pressing the face buttons, beating Jet Li's rise to honor to the punch and kick by a whole year. Now, you might think this control method was chosen due to the clacky nature of the Xbox's hardy control sticks, but no! Chris confirmed with me that this was something that had been in the works since the first iteration on the GameCube, which, speaking for myself here, is rather difficult to imagine. 
flicking the little yellow nipple nub on Nintendo's cozy Indigo controller seems unideal in retrospect, but it was all an attempt to keep the control scheme simple and easy to remember for newcomers and younger fans alike. Now, considering how much in common Ghoulies had with traditional brawlers, one of the staple features of that genre, two-player co-op, was indeed considered for a time and even got up and running, but technical hurdles and it not quite fitting with the design sent it to an early grave. Speaking of cut content, the various unused enemies and character models I mentioned earlier were actually planned to be repurposed in a rather novel and incredibly rare-esque way. A museum-like wing to the mansion had originally been scoped out, which would have housed several of these unused models as a bit of a cheeky easter egg that most, if not all, players wouldn't even notice. You may have noticed, however, I'm describing this museum in the past tense because, in an ironic twist, it was entirely cut from the game due to time constraints, which is, ah, uh, that's just so rare Avon. Thankfully, images of these characters, like werewolves and a Dr. Crackpot mini-boss concept, at least lived on in an unlockable art section of the storybook, which was a fairly common thing for the team to do, according to Steve Mails. The motto here seems to have been, not got time, put it in the book. And then, much like the name of the game itself, Rare also tried to sneak in several masked double entendres within various NPC dialogue, with the vast majority coming in the form of exclamations from the jovial but semi-foul-mouthed Fiddlesworth. Such cut lines included, Bash my beef! Choke my chicken! And finally, Wash my lettuce! The meaning of which, designer Steve Malpass, in the Rare Revealed interview, claims ignorance of, as it's something that has a different interpretation in North America versus the UK. It was then, at the 2003 Electronic Entertainment Expo, where Grab by the Ghoulies made its public debut, and while the response wasn't exactly negative, there was a lot of reiterating from various previews that it was not some massive free-roaming collectathon platformer, nor an intense action game with a ton of depth. It was more of a pick-up-and-play arcade-style game that threw waves of enemies at the player as they cleared each room with the help of temporary power-ups, which honestly owed a bit more to the likes of Rare's own Attic Attack, or say, Atari's Gauntlet, even down to the Grim Reaper suddenly waving a threatening bony finger at you. This sentiment was also echoed by Greg Mayles, who said to RareGamer.uk that, when we did arcade stuff in the old days, we had this idea for a multiplayer brawler, but it never really suited the arcades. When the console came along, I found the idea of one character fighting many really intriguing. That got channeled into Ghoulies, where the idea was to have you surrounded by enemies, almost like a bad martial arts film where the hero stands in the middle and each of the bad guys take their turn to try their luck. So, to the team, this was a bit of an homage to those older titles during Rare's ultimate Play the Game days, and also represented a fun break from the complexities of making giant multifaceted platformers. Unfortunately, a good chunk of reactions from both fans and critics alike didn't really seem to take that intention into account, which resulted in some reviews which were, and I'm really sorry for this, absolutely ghoulish. Sadly, 2003 didn't seem to be the right time, and the Xbox certainly didn't seem to be the right place for Grabbed by the Ghoulies. I'm going to throw over to Chris Sutherland once again for his opinion on the critical reception of Cooper's first and most likely last video game adventure. I think we had hoped people would enjoy it, but it was quite a different game from the Banjo series with its linear path, and I think maybe the visual style didn't fit so well with modern tastes, which were looking for more realism than cartoon visuals. As a result, it didn't do that well commercially. The reviews were mixed. I was amused to look them up just now and see it referred to as a boring repetitive snooze fest that can't decide if it's for kids or adults. Gameplay wise, this is a disaster from EGM. And finally, one of the stupidest, most disappointing games of all time, Game Informer from December 2003. Damn, Game Informer, who the hell grabbed your ghoulies? 
Uh, so clearly this wasn't the experience most people were expecting slash wanting at that particular point in time. Some assumed that with Rare no longer working under Nintendo, they would finally be unshackled and be allowed to make some epic cutting edge RPG with like nudity or a gritty mature rated gore fest, but that was never really the studio's MO. The X-Rare staff I spoke to all said Microsoft had purchased them to broaden their user base with more family friendly titles anyway, and Ghoulies just happened to be the one title they had in production that was the simplest to develop and the furthest along, but also now had to be the standard bearer for a new period in Rare's history. Whether we want to or not even though it maybe wasn't the best candidate for the job. If this had been released back on the GameCube alongside the likes of Star Fox Adventures or Donkey Kong Racing, it probably would have done just fine and be seen as just a breezy stopgap romp between their bigger titles. With that said, looking back on its reception years later, Greg Mayles admitted to RareGamer.uk back in 2017 that the transition from GameCube to Xbox was so late in development that we didn't really have time to adapt it to an Xbox audience. I would have certainly aged it up a bit. The gameplay, I felt, was sound. If I had another six months, I would have changed the tone, perhaps make it a teen-rated game rather than an E-rated one. I wouldn't have gone Resident Evil with it, but it was very Scooby-Doo. I would have gone somewhere in between. It would have been slightly grittier, and that would have pushed the humor and the fighting in a slightly different way. I often joke about how poorly received that game was. The sales were not what we wanted, but it's almost been given a second life with Rare Replay, and now it is backwards compatible on Xbox One. It doesn't seem like a sequel to Ghoulies was ever seriously considered, although I'm sure many on the team would have loved to flesh out the concept even further. Since the sales seemed to be pretty dire, after its completion, most of the team then moved on to either the Viva Pinata series, which thankfully did find an audience on Xbox, and Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, another example of a game Rare poured their hearts into, but wasn't exactly what most fans had wanted, and yes of course I've covered its development story before. Nowadays, you'll find players that have a certain fondness for Ghoulies, especially in regards to its charming visuals, which have held up quite nicely since 2003. Overall though, it's still a testament to Rare's incredible streak of hits in the 90s and beyond that, while not all universally praised, you couldn't honestly say with a straight face that any of them were unplayable disasters. I mean, seriously Game Informer, one of the stupidest, most disappointing games of all time in 2003? Did you not play Drake and the 99 Dragons or Big Motherfucking Rigs? Thanks again to Chris Sutherland and Steve Mails for answering my questions on all things ghoulies. And a big ups of course goes to Daily Kong for making that connection for me. And if you out there know of any other games, films, or whatever with similar spooky stories, let me know in the comments below or enter the dusty, web-filled hallways of my social media. See you next time and thanks for watching!